We, I'd like you to do the same thing as we, as we have done with all the plenaries. Please turn around to the camera, wave and say hello to the people out there. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I can't think of a better way to close a conference like our conference than having Jamie Caddy, the talented Jamie Caddy, as the plenary speaker. Thank you. Jamie, the floor is yours. Eu como as minhas ervilhas com mel. Fiz isto toda a minha vida. Isto faz as ervilhas terem um sabor estranho, mas faz com que Elas não caiam da faca. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Has anybody read the title of this talk or the summary or the abstract? <laughs> What's the point? I was hoping that this talk might coincide with um, my first ever midlife crisis. I think the timing's quite good, actually. I think I'm, I think I'm having my first ever midlife crisis. <laughs> Is anybody here having or had a midlife crisis? <laughs> it's come a lot earlier than I expected. I didn't realize I was middle-aged. And um, when, you, when you have a midlife crisis, I was told that, well, I think we all know what you do if you're a man. You, you, buy, a, you buy a special fancy sports car, don't you? Is that the way? But how am I going to do that, working in ELT? <laughs> it's not easy. It's not something we talk about, is it, very much? Nobody, want, nobody joining me in a midlife crisis here. It's not the end of the world. It's just, a, it's just a few, I don't know, how, I've no idea how long they last. Do they last a week or, I'm, I mean, I'm some, there's mostly, most of your women, females here, and some of you will have been married to men that have gone through midlife crises. Is that possible? How long do they last? <laughs> Forever. That's not good news for me. So, what's the point? That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> what's the point? You see, um, maybe I should have written course books. You know, um, I've, I've got to say thank you for Oxford. Thank you to Oxford for, for bringing me. I've written two methodology books um, for Oxford. And I'm very proud of these books. And I've, I love them as if they're my own. <laughs> <laughs> they are my own. <laughs> Um, but they don't make a lot of money. Methodology books don't make the big money, do they? They don't make the big bucks. If you want to make the big bucks in ELT, you've got to write course books. And I have been given the, the opportunity. I have been asked in the past, and I, 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 I've got no problem with course books at all. I know some of my, some other conference speakers do. I know that, but I don't. I've got no problem with them at all. It's just that I don't think it's my kind of thing. I don't really think I could write a course book. I've got some of my best friends are course book writers, and I know that they, they can afford cars. But, um, <laughs> but sometimes I get asked if I'd like to write a course book, and I always get flattered, and I go, that's really nice. Um, what shall I say? Shall I say I don't think I'm capable of it, or shall I say thank you and let me think about it? And I never really know what to say, you know? So I've got this thing I do now. I say, oh, thank you for giving me the invitation to write a course book, I, I, um, let, me, let me pitch you an, a, an even better idea than yours. I've got this idea for a course book which is completely free of aims and objectives. And, that, and, and I'm going to call it pointless. It's going to be pointless, it's absolutely aimless. 
or maybe aimless, it's absolutely pointless. What do you think about the idea of a course book which has got no aims or objectives? Is that a silly idea? <laughs> you'd never sell it, would you? Could you sell it? You'd never sell it. You'd be crazy, wouldn't you? Would, would anybody here buy a course book with no aims or objectives in it? You could pick it up at a conference. You wouldn't have to buy it. You'd just pick it up, couldn't you? How, 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 would, you, how would you imagine it to be, a course book without any aims or objectives? How would you imagine it to be? What would be the content? Yes. So when you say free, free to do whatever you want, like unit three, page one, just blank pages, you are free to do whatever you want. <laughs> I kind of like that. Is it? <laughs> That's one possibility. Fill it in as you go along. <laughs> Any other possibilities here? I imagine it if it could exist, and maybe one day it will exist. I think we'd have to reconsider the branding. I don't think we could actually call it pointless. But I would imagine it to be rich in stories. Story rich. Narrative strong. And the stories... The story texts would be full of language which the writers have considered as the most useful language that students can take from it. And the stories would be there as kind of springboards to get students talking and discussing and curious and sharing and speaking and writing and just basically being immersed in language. And I think that, I think I kind of like that idea. Are you, are you interested? The reason I'm doing this, the Oxford girls are sitting right here in the, the front row, and I'm actually pitching to them. <laughs> um, you see, I love stories, and I love storytelling, and I do workshops with teachers on storytelling. And one of the questions that I get asked again and again is, well, you know, we kind of enjoyed that workshop or that session, but what, what was the point? <laughs> and I know where this question is coming from, and you do too, right? When we say, what's the point? We're talking, I think, about um, aims and objectives, perhaps of the narrow variety. Do you know what I'm talking about? Give me an example. Is it? Yes. So present perfect could be the aim or objective, to teach the present perfect. It's funny that, isn't it? It's present perfect quite often comes to the front, doesn't it? So present perfect, second conditional, third conditional, infinitive of purpose, present continuous tenses. You tend to often associate language points with becoming grammar points, becoming these narrow aims and objectives. And... Um, I'd just like to say today for this last session that I don't think you always have to have them, do you? Ever. <laughs> Sometimes. I don't know, I'm not sure. <laughs> but what I've got for you today, I've got four stories, four stories of absolute pointlessness. What I want to do is I'd like to make this talk the most pointless talk I've ever given in my life. How do you feel about that? Are you tired? Yes. It's been a long three days, isn't it? I shouldn't be asking you hard questions, should I, really? Put up your hands if you're tired. <laughs> Show me, do, if you're kind of getting to, the, getting to tiredness, do that. If you're absolutely full of energy and full of beans, do this. Yes! Oh, that's, a good, that's enough of you, that's enough of you. Okay. <laughs> Was anyone at my session earlier today? Do you remember my, my nephew, yes. the older one, yes. whose name is Tomas? He's now six years old. He lives in Barcelona because my sister lives in Barcelona too. I live in Barcelona. I was there first. <laughs> my sister copied me. 
and she thought it would be a good idea to meet a, a madrileño called Pablo and have children with them together. And they've got two, two little boys. And Tomas, that you met today, is six. Mateo, who you met today, was, I think he was maybe one. He's now f three and a half. I forget. <laughs> Bad uncle, no? But I used to take Tomas to the park. And you know the, you know the park, yeah? Not the specific park I'm talking about, but in general, you know, you know children's parks. You know the things that children play on. You know the that, yeah. You know the, what, what's that? Yeah, you know the, yeah, yeah. Slide, what, what's, what are slides all about? Well, for fun, yeah, that's a good question. There's, a, there's a, definitely a point to slides, isn't there? It's fun. Who's, who's, who's been on a slide recently? Be completely honest. You, you, you put your hand up first. Tell us about you being on a slide. Ah, were you demonstrating? What's your name? Elsa. Elsa. Okay, is there anybody who's been in a slide without a child present? <laughs> Tell us everything. <laughs> That's great. Anyone, anyone else been in a slide recently without a child? Without a, yes, you, tell us about it. Hi. Hello. Hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. You're looking good. Great, great lecture in the morning. I'm still wondering about this one. Tell us about your slide story. It was so high. It was like two <laughs> meters and a half high. I just had to go. This was on Terceira Island, uh -huh. close to Angra do Heroísmo, empty park. And me and my girlfriend were there. We just saw that huge slide, and we said, let's go for it. <laughs> let's the slide, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Phrasing. <laughs> What, what's your girlfriend's name? Joanna. So you said to Joanne, let's go for it. Yes. And she was thinking, is he going to ask the question? And you said, come on on the slide, baby. <laughs> I figured out a better way to ask the question. <laughs> is it possible that you did anything to drink? Nope. No? Not at all. Just inebriated by the <laughs> With beautiful... Life. So you hadn't had anything to drink? No. What was my question I just asked there? What was the purpose? Is it possible that you... Is it possible that you had... Had... Any, what's that tense? When did we last study that? Do you remember? When did we last study the, that tense, the past perfect? And by the way, I'm very, very happy that you identified that structure as the past, the past perfect, because it's quite... It's an advanced one, and we've only gone over it once, two weeks ago, do you remember? Which unit's in? Unit 8, I think. <laughs> I'm just being silly. You know I'm being silly. But I have a teacher friend called Nicola. Nicola's a very good trainer, and she talks about weaving. When you get a piece of language, or a new language point, or a new word, or a new phrase, try as a teacher to throw it in whenever you can, and then draw attention to it. She calls that weaving. Um, did anyone come to my live lesson yesterday? I tried a little bit of weaving. Do you remember I, I, I taught sweet or savory? And then later, somebody thought that the phrase above the canal was something to eat. <laughs> and I said, what is it, sweet or savory? That's weaving. That's me trying to remember the words, the phrases, the language items that we've already met and being this kind of teacher, trying to be aware and trying to bring them back into play whenever possible. Um, anyway, slides, 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 slides. So Tomas, at the age of about, I think he's about two and a half, he used to, you know, he was getting on the slide, he needed a bit of help at first, but then he, he, he started to become independent, and he would climb up the steps and slide 
down the slide without any help from uncle. And I was kind of impressed. And we did this two or three times. And one day I'm sitting on the bench watching him do his thing, walking up the steps, sliding on the side. I was probably on my phone or something. And I noticed him doing something that I found quite interesting. Um, I suppose as human beings, we tend to get bored of routine, don't we? Thrills, like slides, have got limited <laughs> life expectancy. <laughs> Do you know what he did? What? Sorry? Okay, that's interesting. He went down not foot first, but head first. Before that, I think he did that the next time, but before he did that, he climbed up the slide and then walked down the steps. <laughs> and if there's anything that has got to be the absolute definition of pointless creativity or creative pointlessness, that's it. That to me is the perfect image of pointless creativity or creative pointlessness. I can't decide which one it is. And that's coming from a two and a half year old. If you ask the question, Thomas, why did you do that? He can't even comprehend the question why. That's the end of my story. That's my first story of pointlessness. What did you think of my story? RateMyStory.com. Was it, is there anything you can take away from that story? I don't know. Is there any takeaways? Anyone want to offer a, mor a morale? A moral? A morale? A moral? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone want to give me a bit of morale, moral support? <laughs> but what could you take away from my story of pointlessness? Anyone want to interpret it? Sorry? Weaving. Weaving's important. That, that was what I was trying to do there, was just show you how to weave in a teacher-led storytelling. I didn't set out to teach the past perfect, or in this case, rather, to revise the past perfect, but it came up. So that's, that's, that's teachers being aware. There was no aim or objective, but it came up. Um, what about the content of the story? Anything you'd want to take away from that? An interpretation? I know it's late. I know you're tired. But some of, you put, some of you did that, remember? So those of you who did that, what would you say? Humans get bored of routines. They like a bit of surprise, perhaps. Great. That's the kind of thing I'm looking for. Anything else? Challenges. Sorry, over here someone said? And you mentioned outcomes there. What would you say the outcome of going down a slide the wrong way is? En enjoyment. And it's an interesting word, outcome, isn't it? Are there any teacher trainers here? Are there, who, who's, who has recently become a teacher? Anyone become a teacher in the last year? Any newly qualified teachers here? So, do you, do you remember? <laughs> do you remember doing your teacher training all those, all those years ago? And this is, this is my experience. I'm not sure if it's going to be yours. But your, your trainer, who sat at the back of the class watching you do your thing, said, well, Jamie, you know, it was, it was a, you know, did you achieve your aims and objectives? <laughs> and you go, oh, I don't really know because I don't really know what my aims and objectives were. Or maybe you, maybe you, <laughs> actually, <laughs> more likely, more likely, you did know what your aims and objectives were because that was the time when it was really drummed into you that you have to have aims and objectives, isn't it? And I just think sometimes, we, we know, don't we, that learning is very chaotic and we know that learning is, is unpredictable and personalized. I told you that silly story about Tomas and the slide 
you could share your experience of that story. Maybe it leads to a story that you've got. Maybe you interpret it in one way or another. Perhaps you take some different language from the text, but everybody will compute and interpret and analyze and experience that story in a different way. And when you take the narrative of a lesson, which starts when students enter the class and ends when students leave the class, maybe even goes on further than that, if you've given them homework, Everybody's going to experience that in exactly the same way. They're not, are they? <laughs> Everyone's going to have a completely different experience of that. And um, I think, you know, going down slides the wrong way is kind of what I like to do in my class and see what happens. But you've got to have this awareness. My second story of pointlessness involves... Pointless death. Sorry about that. I apologize in advance. You came to this closing session thinking it was going to be joyful. <laughs> and we're talking about death. And I'm it involves the largest reptile in the United Kingdom that we can find in the wild as opposed to in the zoo. So it, this involves the largest reptile in the United Kingdom that you would find in the wild as opposed to in the zoo. Are you with me? <laughs> the story which involves the largest reptile in the United Kingdom. Great structure. What do you call that structure? Exactly. That's a superlative it's a super litive, <laughs> as I used to call them. The largest reptile in the United Kingdom that you could find in the wild, as opposed to in the zoo, which is, bet you don't know. What did you say? Loch Ness. Loch Ness. <laughs> <laughs> Nessie, Nessie Loch Ness. I don't, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to start this story again. <laughs> this story involves the second largest <laughs> reptile. <laughs> what is it? What is the second largest reptile in the United Kingdom? Hmm? Yeah, somebody said a snake. What kind of snake? An adder. Well, I, I, my, my source here is Wikipedia. I just checked it. This is a story I've actually never told before. And so I had to check my facts. And according to Wikipedia, the largest reptile, second largest, in the United Kingdom in the wild is a grass snake. How big do you think the female grows to? Guess. Ten centimeters, did you say? <laughs> Is that what <laughs> Eighty centimeters. The female is capable of growing to eighty centimeters. The male? Sixty centimeters. So in the world of grass snakes, males are smaller than females. No idea what that means. <laughs> but now the funny thing is about this is that um, who speaks Spanish? In Spanish, and when I'm doing when I'm doing teacher-led storytelling, and this is this is the kind of thing I like to do in the classroom: stories that are interactive, asking questions, driving discussion, putting students into pairs, all in this framework of this narrative. And one of the things I do a lot is to use translation. For example, I might say, "How would you say in English, yo tenía un gran snake de mascota?" How would you say that in English? You could say, I had a pet grass snake. What I've written down in here is, I, yes, do you remember that structure? What day did we do that structure? I used to have a pet grass snake. It's true. 
I used to have a pet grass snake, and I've got some more questions for you. What do you think would be a good name for a pet grass snake? <laughs> Sorry? Grassy. Grassy, like the dog lassie, but this is la grassy. <laughs> yes. Do you remember Monty Python? When I was a little boy, and I was only eight years old when I had my pet grass snake, I used to think, I used to think, I used to think that Monty Python was a famous snake. <laughs> I really, really did. I, this is before my dad introduced me to, to the fish slapping dance. So when I got my pet grass snake for my birthday, there was only one name for him. He was called Monty Grass Snake. <laughs> It's true. What color was he? Can you guess? Now, some grass snakes are brown. Mine was green and black. Green and black. And um, what, where, whereas, whereas birds have feathers, reptiles have scales. It's good. So do musicians. <laughs> exactly. Now, this is, the, this is quite, a, I don't know what you're going to think of this question. What, what pet grass snakes, what do they eat? Any ideas? What do they eat? Grass snakes are carnivorous, very much carnivorous. I suppose they're called grass snakes because you, you see them slither through the grass. I don't know. But they don't eat grass. We were given a choice. You can either feed it goldfish or mice. Now, if you were the owner of a, of a grass snake, would you choose to feed it goldfish or mice? Mice. Why mice? Why? Why? Why mice? I th we tried both. We, we tried a mouse, but I think that Monty Grass Snake wasn't all that interested in the mouse. In fact, I think he made friends with it. <laughs> um, so he had to eat goldfish in a little dish, and he'd watch it for ages, and suddenly he'd go, bam! This big lump would go down its, through its body. Um, what's the verb that you associate snakes with? Slither, Slither exactly. Um, what else do you think Monty could do? He was an absolute expert. Hissing, tss, flicking out his tongue. <laughs> he was a great swimmer, a great swimmer. What are the four strokes in swimming? What's that one? The crawl, what's that one? What's that one? What's that one? <laughs> Monty didn't either do any of those. <laughs> he had his own stroke, it was kind of... Um, what else? Yeah, um, my, my relationship with Monty, I mean, I, I did love him. I loved him. I loved him a lot. I really did. I remember being very close to the snake, and uh, I loved him so much. Don't forget, you're going to judge me, but don't forget, I was eight years old. I loved him so much that I used to do this thing with him. <laughs> I used to put him down my pajamas and then take him out here. I was kind of showing off. I mean, you've got to agree that that's completely and utterly pointless, isn't it? But I used to think it was quite funny, pajamas, t-shirt, jumper, to put him down here and to take him out here. And he seemed to be cool with it. And I used to show the visitors, look, and they'd go, ooh, what a horrible little boy. And I thought it was cool, I thought it was fun. Until one day, I put him in there, and he came out there, and he wasn't moving. And I held him, and I went to see my mum. Mummy, what's wrong with Monty? I think he's dead. And of course, I burst into tears, and it was a sad time. Pointless death, completely pointless. <laughs> He'd still be around today, I'm sure, would he not? If... So do you know what I did to deal with this? I wrote a poem. <laughs> Would you like me to 
recite my poem to you. Okay. My grass snake was green and black. He had lots of scales upon his back. <laughs> so funny. He ate goldfish in a little dish. His tongue flicked out and then flicked in. <laughs> He slithered through the grass, where in the sun he shone like brass. And when the end came to him, I buried him in a little tin. It was actually a little coffee tin. I remember coffee tins were quite important in my household back then. And uh, we used to, coffee came in coffee tins. And I buried Monty in a coffee tin and put him, buried him at the end of the garden, and he rest in peace for two weeks, <laughs> until I got curious and dug him up to see how he was getting on. <laughs> and he was fine. <laughs> he was fine. I was a bit freaked out by rigor mortis, but he, there is, you know, looking back, was it, was it a pointless death? Yes, it was a pointless death, but some good came out of it. Sorry. The f my poem. And you know what else? This is absolutely true. My poem got published on the back of the school magazine. <laughs> but, but, there was a typo. And instead of saying, and when the end came to him, I buried him in a little tin. They printed, and when the end came to him, I buried him in a little bin. <laughs> and that really upset me. It really upset me. <laughs> because it kind of, for me, it reinforced this idea that perhaps his life had been a waste and it was a pointless death. But I got, I got this story and I got the poem. And that's a story, actually, I said I'd never told anyone that, but it's a story, that's the kind of story that I like to share with my students. And if you take a teacher storytelling approach, you can create this repertoire of a number of anecdotes of your own, meaningful things from your own experience when you were a little girl, little boy, your student's age. Prepare it. This was kind of dialogic. I call this a dialogic story because it's, it's very interactive. All these were questions I was asking to my students, lo looking for these language learning opportunities, making use of them, taking advantage of them when I can. Um, and you can build up a repertoire of anecdotes or stories which you've tried to make as pedagogical as you possibly can. What do you think of that? And it's great. Course books are great, but sometimes it's lovely just to go off-piste and have a lesson which is completely and utterly human-human interaction. And the best way I know to do that is by starting things off with a story and getting students into interacting. Is everybody happy? <laughs> do you know, um, so what were your aims? What were your objectives? That question from the trainer. What were your aims? What were your, what were your objectives? Did you fulfill your aims? Did, did you meet them? And let's just do a little experiment here. I want you to think of the very last new language item that you have acquired. It could be in Portuguese, it could be in English, maybe Spanish, maybe another language that you're learning. The last language item that you can recall that you've actually acquired a word, an adjective, a verb, a phrase, a collocation, a grammar structure, a nice juicy idiom. Just think about this. Great, you've got one, right? What's yours? Toy, toy, toy. Can you explain that? Good luck. Good luck. In, what? In what language? Yeah. Ah, toy, toy, toy. <laughs> Don't, I'm not going to ask you to tell me what those, those are, but just put up your hands if you've got one. That's all. Put up your hands if you have identified one. Put up your hands if you haven't identified one yet. Okay, but half and half. Um, so let me just, an experiment here. If you have one, let me see your hands. I've got one in, in, in Spanish. Um, trabar is a, a verb, trabar. It means like to get stuck, 
like you might get your zip stuck or a football game might be a bit stuck. It's not really fluid. So that would be a, a game, trabado. And a trabalenguas is when your tongue gets stuck. That's a tongue twister. So that, that was for me. And it came, through, it came through conversation in my bar in Barcelona, speaking with a friend, a Spanish friend. And he, he said that the, 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 the game, the match that we were watching was a bit trabado. And that was new for me. Um, anyone got in, do let me see your hands again? So my question is, this is the, the experiment. Did, did you learn that word, that language item, that collocation, that idiom, that structure, whatever? Did you learn it as a result of an aim or an objective? In other words, did you specifically set out to learn it, or did somebody else specifically set out to teach it to you? That's not very remarkable, is it? Would you agree that most things that you've learned as a language learner in your profession or your lifetime as a student, as a teacher, have been resulting, have resulted rather through some sort of randomness or a chaos? I'm not assuming this is the case for everybody here. I, I, I think aims object to sometimes work if you do them well. I do think, though, in order for us to fulfill, or actually for aims and objectives to be met, it requires a huge amount of experience for, from teachers. And I do think that when we ask our newly qualified teachers or our trainees to do it, we're asking them to do the most difficult thing of all. I would, as a teacher trainer, rather or prefer my trainees to tell a story and to see how well they get on and to see how well they communicate. Do they grade their language? Are they, compre are they comprehended? Are they speaking too fast? Are they giving too much information? Are they using enough space, repetition? Can they draw attention to any language features? I quite like that idea, personally. But not, not everybody does. Do you know what the difference between aims and objectives and outcomes? is. Aims and objectives on one hand, outcomes on the other, because they're often conflated. You talk about stated outcomes, don't you? But it's very strange, that's a kind of oxymoron or an oxymoron. Superlative, superlative. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> If learning, if we know that learning is completely unpredictable, chaotic, and personalized in a sense, then, then to, to talk about outcomes must be a description of what happens after the lesson. So you, I find it difficult to talk about outcomes before the, before the lesson has begun. Do you see what I'm, I'm saying? Aims and objectives are what the teacher has before the lesson Outcomes are what students take away with them after the lesson. And the two things are actually kind of different. There's a big discrepancy. For my Monty Grassnake story, one person may have taken away in the wild. Someone might have taken away the superlative, the largest or the second largest reptile in the United Kingdom there was used to. There was, there was all sorts of language going on, and with a little bit of help from your guide, the teacher, different people, different students will notice different things. And I think there's this one word that it comes down to, and that one word is awareness. Do we use that word? I think it can be used, I think it's a great word for teachers to develop this awareness. Awareness of what comes up. So, my kind of idea, and this is my main idea right now, it's okay to drop the aims and objectives if you can raise your awareness. My third story of pointlessness is actually called Pointless. And it's a story I've written especially for you. I've never told anyone this story before. It's, it's the, main, the main character is Kevin. Kevin. I'm going to read this to you because I've actually, this is a prepared text I've got, you see. Now, Kevin, Kevin was brought up well. 
he was always taught two things. Number one, never bite the hand that feeds you. And number two, never poo on your own doorstep. Do you know those, those, have you heard those before? Yeah. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, don't prune you. What's the difference between those idioms? Do, 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 they, do they translate well into Portuguese? Yeah. yeah. yeah? Can, can you explain to me what they mean? In English or in Portuguese? In English or Portuguese, if, assuming that the semantics are more or less the same. Yeah. Can you give me an example of not be biting... Okay, so we'll, we'll take the semantics as read then. Okay, now, although sometimes Kevin did do the latter, he always respected the hand. After all, he depended on it. And over the years, he formed a very good relationship with it. But unfortunately, Kevin was about to learn an important life lesson. And it's this. Sometimes those with great power do not appreciate the responsibility that comes with it. Would you agree with that? That sometimes those with great power sometimes don't appreciate the responsibility that comes with it? Can't possibly think of anyone right now that I could apply to. <laughs> <laughs> now we don't know the reason for this perhaps the hand was bored or perhaps it just needed to remind Kevin who was the boss in this relationship Kevin stood speechless a broken gerbil it's the perfect image of betrayal the hand that fed him became the hand that failed him and all that was sacred was now lost. How could Kevin forgive? How could Kevin forget? How could he ever trust again? His life was now pointless. Hello, darkness, my old friend. You can take a photograph if you like this. Now, this is, this is, there's a lot of quite difficult language, I would say, in here. Um, we start with Kevin was brought up well. But, you know, this is a, I've, I've made this text for, especially for you. Who considers themselves to be here a learner of English still? Even though you're, you're an expert, who considers themselves to be a learner of English? So if you consider yourself to be a learner of English, have a look at this text and just think to yourself, oh, my goodness me, sorry. I won't do that again. I'll start again. If you consider yourself to be a learner of English, have a look at this text and just think, if you could take away six words or phrases or collocations or structures or idioms from this text, what would they be? Actually, let's not say six. Let's just say three. Choose three. And when you've chosen three, turn to your neighbor and tell your neighbor which language items you've chosen and why. Feel free to do that right now. Raquel, did you choose anything from here? No. <laughs> Anyone want to share something they like? Specifically? Can you give me a specific? 
So doorstep. Yeah, doorstep here is a metaphorical use of a tangible noun, isn't it? Doorstep in this case means your immediate environment. Yes. Sorry? Gerbil's a great word, isn't it? The one thing I like about this text is it's such a low-frequency word that if you don't know what it means, the whole essence and meaning of the text is kind of taken away from you. You'll find out in a moment. Yes. Give me some more. So yours, your word is gerbil. Give me some more language items specifically that you would like to take away from this text and remember. Did any, Sorry? Pointless. 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 What's the noun of pointless? Pointless is an adjective. What's the noun equivalent? Pointlessness. Yeah. Would you like to meet Kevin? <laughs> Kevin the gerbil. My old friend I've come to talk with you again Because a vision softly creeping Left its seeds while I was sleeping And the vision <laughs> We referred to this earlier as a, a video telling sandwich Text, video text, and the second time you see the text, I'm going to guess that it becomes a bit more meaningful. Am I right? So perhaps you might decide to choose to learn an important lesson. To learn an important lesson is something we say, it's a, and again, it's a metaphor. Maybe it's not such a metaphor, but we use it in life talking about things you learn that are important, not aims and objective type learning, but chaotic, random type of learning. Um, Kevin has learned a lesson. Um, what else is there maybe we could change or we could take? Speechless is a good word, isn't it? Did anyone choose speechless? Did anyone choose the passive to be brought up well? Did anyone choose never bite the hand that feeds you? The, the point that I'd like to make here is that you've, I've been in this situation where we're given this task, and the task is that you, the teacher, are given a text, and the trainer says, what would you use this text to teach? What language? And you look for lots of repeated items, and often those repeated items tend to be predictable things like, for example, present simple. Or maybe there's two or three passives in here. Um, sometimes there's just basically we can say present narrative tenses, but so often there's not much else to say, isn't there? I don't think that's a problem. I think that if you set up this task for your students, show them the text, give them the text, invite them to work with it and to specifically choose the language from it that they'd like to take away here and then come back the next day, can they remember which language items they chose? I really like that way of doing that, that, that kind of working with text. In fact, I like it so much that I never ever do a text activity without it. And if you were at the live lesson yesterday, I've got a, a, a confession to make. I kind of ran out of time. I don't know if you realized that, but there was, I wanted to move on to this stage in that lesson, give the students the text, ask them to choose language they like from it, and then invite them to take it away here and remember it for the rest of their lives. But we kind of ran out of time there, so that was, we were getting to each other. Yeah. Have you heard the term zero uncertainty? Put up your hands if you heard the term zero uncertainty. I came across this term first on Scott Thornbury's blog, as A to Z. Who can describe what zero uncertainty is? Yes. Sorry? It's a very personal thing. When you, 
when you reach a stage with a text, very specifically with a text, that you are satisfied that you understand every word in the text without any more questions for your teacher or for your dictionary, you have reached zero uncertainty. And I think you have to reach zero uncertainty before you actually do this activity of take away these, these pieces of language. And a really nice way to reach zero uncertainty is to use translation. Anyone here like translation? No? Oh, translation is beautiful. It's the most natural thing that happens in language, in language learning, in language teaching, in language use, and everything, especially in this crazy globalized world in which we live. Tell you what, I'm going to give you a text here, and I want you to translate it. I want you to translate it into English, all right? Are you ready? Eo komu esh minyesh ervilyesh kommel. Fijistu toda e minha vida. Istu faz es ervilhes terim um sabor estranho. Mes faz com cu eles não caiam da faca. Did I make a mistake? Was it okay? My, my, my three Portuguese teachers are sitting in the front row here, the Oxford girls, who, if you think I did a good job then, it was, you, you've got to congratulate my teachers. Okay, so the first line, Eu como es minhas ervilhas com mel. Now, what we've got here is a little stupid pointless, this is the most pointless, but it rhymes. A, B, a, B. So you're absolutely right. I eat my peas with honey. Fiz isto toda e minha vida. Now, I am absolutely forcing you, and that's the word, forcing you to produce a present perfect structure. This is the only way I know to create the right conditions which absolutely require your students to produce a present perfect structure. So I'm not going to accept that there's not a place for translation in the classroom. Translation is nothing less than beautiful. So I eat my peas with honey again. I've, I've done it. I have done it all my life. I've done it all my life. Isto faz es ervias terim um sabor estranho. <laughs> yes. Now again, isn't that a lovely structure? Make you happy, make you sad. It can be an adjective or it can be a verb. Make you do your homework. But here it's an adjective. And not everybody realizes that funny can be funny ha-ha or funny strange. So again, I've set up this, this, these conditions where students have to come out with funny because it's got to rhyme with honey. So I eat my peas with honey. I've done it all my life. It makes the peas taste funny. Mesh faz com cu elish nao kayam da faca. But it keeps them on the knife. I eat my peas with honey. I've done it all my life. It makes the peas taste funny, but it keeps them on the knife. <laughs> Do you like that? It's really funny because I, I, didn't tell, I didn't tell the Oxford girls here why I was doing this. They've got no idea. And they kept saying to me, why a knife? Why not a fork? <laughs> So, what was the aim? What was the objective? You just don't know. But if you, if you create the right situation, students might learn. There's a really good word. It's becoming quite catchy or rather trendy in, in language teaching. And sometimes words and ideas come into fashion. And sometimes they're a bit, mm, but I like this one. And the word is affordance. Have you heard that word? 
affordance. It's a great word. Let me give you the definition. And this again comes from Scott Thornbury's blog. I think Scott Thornbury wrote this. Um, an affordance is a particular property of the environment. So it's actually been borrowed from the world of, uh, of science and ecology and biology. A particular property of the environment that is potentially useful to an organism, for example, a leaf, a beautiful green leaf on a tree, right? It's, um, for example, it affords food for some creatures, shade for other creatures, building materials for other creatures. Um, a, a synonym of, of to afford is to provide. Um, it's the same leaf. The leaf is the same, but it, its affordances differ depending on how it's regarded and by which creature. Does that make sense? Take it into the world of language teaching, and the term is, is used to describe the language learning opportunities that exist in the student's linguistic environment. Um, so if you're going to be aims and objectives low or light, the whole point is to try to make your activities, which you plan, full of learning affordances, unpredictable learning affordances. And the key to doing that is to become aware developing teacher awareness, responding to students, trying to identify these learning opportunities which come from the learning affordances. My last story of pointlessness, it involves a taxi driver and a pineapple. I like taxi drivers. I always enjoy conversations with taxi drivers, but the taxi driver in this story did something absolutely unforgivable. There was three of us in the taxi. There was me, my friend Joe, and a girl called Kath that I had a bit of a crush on. I was 18 years old, a student in Yorkshire, in Leeds. What was the worst thing that a taxi driver could do? I really don't actually remember what the taxi driver did, despite the fact it was unforgivable. It was absolutely unforgivable, but apparently it wasn't unforgettable. And Kath, as a result of whatever it was that this taxi driver did, was crying. She's in the back of the taxi crying. Can you imagine crying? As a result of this taxi driver, did something unforgettable. I can't remember what it was. And Joe said to the taxi driver, pull over, we're getting out. So they pulled over and they got out. And uh, we all got out of the taxi. We kind of tried to comfort Kath from whatever it was that this taxi driver had done. I can't remember what it was. And, um, God, that was incredible. Right in the middle of the road, there was a pineapple. Whole pineapple. And I just looked at the taxi, looked at the pineapple, looked at the taxi. I'd never done anything like this in my life, ever. But I just picked up the pineapple and thought, I'm going to throw it at the taxi. <laughs> so I, and as the taxi was, you know, he was further and further away, but, but I made my decision. And there was no way I was ever going to hit the taxi, but I threw it anyway. It was completely pointless, but I threw it. <laughs> and it was a great throw. Can you guess what happened? Completely missed. <laughs> completely missed the pineapple. The taxi driver drove off into the night. I threw the pineapple, completely pointless. Kath was crying. <laughs> pointless. But later, Kath told me that the first time ever, she thought it was quite attractive. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result of me throwing that pineapple, Kath and I became boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> and we're getting married next Monday. No, no. <laughs> no, we had a lovely relationship. It lasted one year, but it all came from that pineapple. And that's the end of my fourth and final story of pointlessness. We do pointless things. We never know what's going to come out of them. Could have been marriage. In this case, it wasn't. <laughs> have you had fun this weekend? Yes. It's been good, hasn't it? Yes. I have to say a really big thank you to to everybody at Appy. There's, there's a lot of them as well, so I'm not going to name them all, but I can see Alberto right there, and uh, I think we should salute Alberto for a special weekend, and all his team. Alberto, I need you behind him, I can see you. And 
and um, thank you to all of you. Just a quick thing, um, I mentioned this book and that thing that I'd written. A lot of people have been asking me about this book. I'm going to be taking orders for it in the next few days, so if you're interested, the best thing to do is to subscribe to my site here. And there's a little secret. I don't usually tell people this, but when you subscribe, the first thing you do, the first thing I do is to send you a copy of this, The Lost Activities, which is, it's, you didn't know that, did you? Have you got it? Have you? Have you enjoyed it? It's good, isn't it? It's got, <laughs> it's good. basically it's eight activities, some of them video telling activities that I've never published or put on lesson stream before. For example, this one here, Tiny Hamster is Giant Monster. And uh, just before we go, I've got this little song for you. <laughs> I've got a little song. It goes like this. Here's a little song I wrote. Oh, you might like to learn it note for note. Don't worry. Mm -hmm. Come back to Appy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I really like working with Portuguese teachers. You really are such lovely people to work with. And you're, you're no, teachers like this are not the same all over the world. So thank you very much for being such lovely people to work with, making my job easy and enjoyable. And it's been a lovely trip. And I hope to see you again. Keep in touch, OK? Thank you very much. And thank you again to Oxford for making all this possible. Without Oxford, I wouldn't have been here. Thank you.
she smell like you every day. 